joining us to talk about the verdict and its implications is National Chair and Partner in, in, of Finance and Projects at uh, Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas, Mr. L. Vishwanathan. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Vishwanathan. What have you made of this if this verdict? The Allahabad High Court clearly is saying that I'm not going to offer interim, interim relief, uh, but also requesting the government to, to have a conversation with the RBA to find, find some sort of a solution. What are the implications of this judgment in the first place? Thank you. I think the judgment sort of marks, uh, you know, the boundary which the judiciary has set for itself. Uh, the judiciary has not sort of, uh, you know, uh, expressed its sort of intention to cross uh, into the, uh, you know, domain of the executive and the RBI. But equally, the uh, judiciary has sort of, uh, you know, drawn the attention of both the central government and the RBI that there is enough mechanism available uh, in the legislation for them to deal with the uh, unprecedented situation we are uh, faced with. Uh, so I think in terms of respecting the institutional, uh, you know, integrity and the processes, it's a good judgment. And equally, it also sort of reminds the uh, government and the RBI that uh, there are other mechanisms available uh, which they can take recourse to. Uh, Mr. Vishwanathan, and that mechanism seems to have become the story now more than uh, just the power assets. Uh, can you help us with your understanding of what Section 7 entails? Because, uh, you know, I think it's never been used before. Uh, there have been two voices or two views coming out that, one, it is only in reference to the operations of the central bank, and two, that uh, the government can use that section to actually direct uh, the RBI on policy matters as well. What is your understanding, sir? So this section has not been used in this context, if my uh, memory is right. But it's a pretty common provision in most of the other statutes. For example, if you look at uh, you know provisions in other statutes, say governing sort of the TRAI or the electricity you know regulator, wherever there is an independent or a statutory regulator, the government usually reserves the power to give directions to the regulator on matters of policy. So it is a very common provision a provision which has been used in other instances, but possibly not with the uh, Reserve Bank of India. So it is, uh, it is a provision which is quite common, and it's the you know, balance of uh, you know, power or separation of power between the uh, you know, legislature, executive, and the you know, regulator you know, itself. Now, whether this power is going to be exercised in this case, uh, I'm quite sort of uh, skeptical about it because uh, I, I think it's, uh, you know, each institution is, has its own sort of sets of uh, responsibilities and what they need to sort of uh, cater to. But if you look at it, uh, this judgment also reinforces uh, the fact that uh, a resolution is still possible. Uh, the RBI itself has stated before the High Court that there is a provision in the IBC which allows for a a resolution to be done with 90% consent of the lenders. I think that provision is going to be uh, back in focus. Uh, that is my, uh, you know, reading of the situation. Several uh, cases where plans were in preparation, I would expect the stakeholders to try and put together a resolution and still try and implement it using the, uh, you know, 90, uh, you know, percent, uh, you know, settlement window. And that sort of works well within the, uh, you know, regime which the High Court itself has set out. Uh, so the uh, uh, IBC process can start. It's not that the companies will go into liquidation straight away. When the government is in consultation with the RBI, when the high-powered high committee is doing its sort of uh, consultation, it's equally possible on a case-by-case -case basis for the stakeholders to work out a settlement. And even if some cases get admitted into IBC, they can always come up with a settlement based on 90% consent, which the RBA itself has pointed out to the, uh, you know, Halabad High Court that that men, uh, mechanism is available. No, absolutely. And we'll come to that, you know, individual uh, sort of implication for uh, the companies and the lenders. Uh, but just I have one more question on this uh, Section 7. So going by the uh, court's order, which says that the central government shall consider initiation of the consul uh, consultative process contemplated under Section 7 of the RBI Act and conclude the same within 15 days from today. So how do we read that? That either the government now comes in and says that we will not invoke Section 7 uh, and hence lets individual assets, uh, you know, deal with uh, their individual problem, or it says that we are invoking it and then it has to come up with a conclusion in uh, 15 days? Is that the way to understand it? 
That's correct. Both options are possible for the central government to either initiate the consultation. They can initiate the consultation and you know fall short of giving a direction as well. That is also an option which is possible for the uh, you know central government. And it is uh, you know equally possible for the central government to say that since uh, you know there is a high-powered committee which is uh, you know going to look into it, uh, you know it may be a little premature for us to uh, you know uh, give any direction because uh, the high court has also said that uh, RBI now nominees will have to be invited you know for this committee so they may let that process sort of uh, you know develop further to see if uh, you know something some kind of a solution can emerge and i think we'll have to sort of look at this in the backdrop that the rba directive of february 12th is still valid so if cases don't get resolved uh, you know which have not got resolved by yesterday then the ibc process will have to start within the next sort of 15 days and and i think that's where the settlement mechanism which i sort of mentioned earlier will probably come into focus Vishnathan, one sort of uh, question in principle. Uh, if the government invokes uh, Section uh, 7, uh, doesn't this trample on the autonomy of the Reserve Bank of India in spirit, if not in letter? No, I mean, uh, I mean uh, certainly I think that's a delicate uh, question which the government will have to sort of uh, answer. And in fact, the High Court itself has pointed out that the stand of the government earlier was also that you know, we need to sort of leave this to the RBI. But I think the government also has a larger role. Uh, they have to balance the interest of all the stakeholders. Uh, they've got to look at the institutional sort of mechanisms which have been created, and they'll have to function independently and for the purposes they have set. But equally, they also have a larger role to balance the interests of the, you know, uh, you know, power sector and other sectors which may get sort of affected as well. Uh, so it's it's a it's a tough uh, question for the government, and they'll have to balance it and see, uh, uh, you know, how they want to sort of uh, take it to its uh, conclusion. All right, sir. Thank you so much for joining us with that view. Appreciate you taking the time to speak with us.